Let's jump in today. We're going to ask, uh, attempt to answer three questions, um, and I hope that it is good today. So here's the first question that we're going to look at today is, when I tithe, should I give 10% on the gross or the net? Well, it's a good question. Another way to ask that is, when I tithe, should I give 10% off of the before tax amount or after FICA takes my money, right? <laughs> Uh, should I give before tax or after the tax? What goes in my bank account or what I see uh, on my check that I would have gotten paid had there not been taxes? Uh, I think it's a good question. Uh, I've heard that question a lot. I've uh, even asked myself that question. But I think before we, we answer that, I kind of just want to look at even the, the concept of tithing just for a minute. Uh, actually, in our next series, we're going to talk about generosity and tithing is going to be a piece of that. And I encourage you to come. It's going to be uh, a good series, I believe. But the word tithe, what does that word actually mean? Have you ever thought thought, where does the idea of 10% even come from? Like, how did that number, or how did God arrive at that number? Well, the word tithe literally means a tenth, a tenth of something. A tithe of something is just a tenth of it. Like, if I had a hot dog and I gave you a tithe of my hot dog, it would be a tenth of my hot dog, okay? So it just means a tenth. And uh, that's where 10% comes from. Now, in the Bible, uh, we see the first instance of tithing, and we're going to talk about it in just a moment. It's in the book of Genesis chapter 14. Now, I recognize that the subject of tithing uh, it stirs up a lot of conversation, and there's a lot of opinions on it. Some people say, we don't need to tithe. That's an Old Testament law thing, and God isn't into tithing anymore. Some say, no, tithing is something that we as the believer should do, and it's not relegated to a particular piece of the Bible. I just want to share with you that tithing is not something that is just about the law of God. In fact, the first instance of tithing appears 500 years before God gave the Ten Commandments and established what's called the Mosaic Law on Mount Sinai with Moses. And it's a man named Abraham. 500 years before the law was even given, this man Abraham gives a tithe, a tenth of what he has, and he did not do it because God commanded him to do it. He did it as an act of worship. He did it as an act of just him wanting to. And that at the core, when we talk about tithing, we talk about it as an act of worship, as an act of trust, and as an act of faith to God. See, we just believe here in, in Christianity and in this church that everything is God's. In fact, the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's all from him. And that he is our provider. So everything we have, God, by his grace and his mercy and his sovereignty, gave it to us. Right? And it doesn't matter who you work for, who you get paid from, it's God providing for you. It's all from him. And so tithing is this act of worship. Now, I understand that I could never convince anybody, including myself, that living off 90 is better than living off 100. Mathematically, it doesn't work. I didn't get a math degree. I got a language degree. But I do know that 100% is always greater than 90%. I recognize that. Can't convince me otherwise. So this whole concept of giving 10% of my money to God is really, it's, it's not something that we do begrudgingly. It's not something that we do angrily. In fact, it's something that we do as an act of worship and trust. And God, it all came from you anyway. And I'm going to give this to you. And, and I just want to say this. It works. Amen. It just works. I recognize that not every person in this room tithes or gives 10%. I'm not here to make anybody feel guilty. All I'm saying is, I've had my own struggles with it. I've had my own logical struggles with it. You can ask Lauren. I'll talk about this. I'll talk about my personal journey of, of tithing and how I, I came to that uh, in this next series that we do. Is but, but I just, as I started to do it, not angrily, not begrudgingly, but as an act of worship, man, it just changed me, and it just changed my heart, and it just, it just works. God is faithful. And I know I need to answer the question. So let's go um, to Genesis chapter 14. I just want to read this to you. Uh, the first instance of tithing in the Bible. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and a priest of God most high, brought Abram some bread and wine. And Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram, his name hadn't been changed yet to Abraham, gave Melchizedek a tenth 
or a tithe of all the goods he had recovered. So what happened right before this is that Abraham was engaged in a battle with a guy named the king of Elam. And God helped him defeat this king. And as a result of that, Abram got a bunch of stuff, got a bunch of resources. He, he walked out of it richer than he walked into it. And he encounters this man named Melchizedek. The Bible says he's the king of Salem, that he's the priest of God most high. He's a representative of God on earth. There's a lot of discussion on who Melchizedek actually is. Some people believe it was actually Jesus making an appearance in the Old Testament. But regardless, he encounters him. Melchizedek brings him bread and wine, which is significant, kind of symbolic of communion, of what would, would come. And he blesses Abram. And then Abram's response to the blessing of God is to give a tenth, to give a tithe. God did not tell him to do that. We don't know necessarily why other than he wanted to. And he did, gave God a tenth. And then you see, throughout scripture, 500 years later, the law is given, and God instructs his people to tithe, to give 10%. And their 10% wasn't always money, it was maybe their crops, or their, or their cattle, whatever they used to make a living. That God asked them to give him 10%. Now he gave it all to them anyway, so what business partner do you have where the majority partner only gets 10%? It's a pretty good deal, pretty good way to think of it. And we see throughout history that, uh, the biblical history, that this is what the children of Israel did. They tithed and they were blessed. And they did it not angrily, not begrudgingly, but as an act of worship. So when we get down to this question of is it 10% of my before tax or 10% of my after tax, I don't really think that's the issue. And the Bible isn't explicitly clear on which one it should be. Now, I personally, I give off the before tax. That's what I do because that's what I feel like I should do. Not because God brought me to some scripture and pointed it out to me. It's just something I felt peace in my heart about that I'm going to give 10% off my before tax amount. That's what I do. If you don't do that, that's okay. Are you doing something wrong? No. Because I think more than the percentage and more than is it off before or after tax, more than that, God is concerned about your heart. And the attitude and the spirit with which you give. And those who say, well, tithing isn't in the New Testament, so I'm not going to tithe. Okay, that's fine. But let me just point something out to you in the New Testament. Is the, is the attitude with which you give regardless. And God says that he wants a cheerful giver. We cheerfully give. We're never more like God than when we give. Never more like God than when we give. Because for God so loved that he gave. See, and we're not giving to God to get, and God doesn't need your money, because some people are like, I ain't going to tithe, I ain't going to go to church, because the church just wants my money. God just wants my money. And I say, no, God doesn't want your money, he just wants you. Amen. God doesn't care if you have money, he just doesn't want money to have you. Amen. Right? Money is just a resource, it's just a tool. It's just a thing. Money isn't evil, the love of money is evil. God just wants you. Wants you to trust them. And some people say, well, what did God give me? He gave you the very best of heaven in Jesus. Amen. He sacrificed himself. He gave 100% of himself in Jesus. The very best. So when God asks us to tithe and give to him, hey, it's not, I need your money, I want your money. Hey, I just want you, will you trust me? And I just come back to this. It just works. It's like, that is the most you know, profound thing I could tell you today. It works. It does. And I believe me, I've tested it. I mean, I, my journey, I, I'll share it with you in, the, in this coming series. My journey was not like I just woke up, you know, believing in Jesus and thought tithing was the greatest thing in the world. No, not at all. Separating me from my money was like cutting my right arm off. I'm telling you the truth. You can ask my wife. You know, God really, God really worked in me. And, and I'm telling you, my life is fundamentally different now because I, and I, and I would say, just, just to be honest with you, I came to this conclusion not 15 years ago, not 20 years ago, but really more like five or six years ago that I really become a consistent tither and God began to deal with me. So now is that 10% off the, the before or after? I don't know. And more so than the percentage, maybe the question is, God, where's my heart concerning this issue? and help my heart and my attitude with this issue. Because I'm just not a fan of reducing what God asks us to do down to technicalities. And I understand that the heart of the question probably wasn't here at all, so whoever asked that, I'm not coming against you. I think it's a great question, really. You know, to me, the question is just, I just want to do the right thing. I think the right thing in this, in this scenario is just you asking God, hey, wh wh what do you want me to do? 
Where, where, where do you have peace about? And wherever you, can't, you, you end up, good. That's good for you. And I think that's where we should be. Amen? Amen. Cool. All right. Here we go. Here's the next question. Why should I go to church? And is it important that Christians attend church? Good question. Why should I go to church? Anybody ever, ever had that question? Why should I come? Right? Why should I, I be here? I think at the root of this question really is the definition of church for you. How, what do you see church as? Is church for you what we're doing right now? Is church for you just a, a, a one time a week thing where you come and you say, you know, it's a great way to end my week or it's a great way to begin my week, however you view Sunday, if it's the weekend or the beginning of the week. And it's, just, it's just a good thing and, and I enjoy it. Is, is church for you a worship service and a sermon and, and putting something in the offering and maybe even serving? Is it, is it a building? Is it denomination? I mean, church is a loaded term. And however you define it, I think, determines your viewpoint and your answer to that question is, should I go to church? Well, I just kind of want to look at, see, how God defines the church. God never defines the church as what we're doing right now. Do you know that? God doesn't define the church as this building. I grew up with a belief that the sanctuary is holy. No, this sanctuary is neither good nor bad. It just is. This sanctuary isn't holy because God says that we are holy. And we are his sanctuary. Right? So this building, when we go to heaven, it's staying here. This building is going gonna, is gonna to rot. I, think, I praise God for this building, but this building isn't holy. This building isn't what is important to God. We are important to God because God defines his church as people. Look to your left and to your right just for a moment. Swivel. What you just looked at is the church. That's the church. It's not my message. It's not Tim and the worship team, although I thought it was great today. Yeah. Not, it's not that. Not their songs. It's not, you know, what we did and if you gave in the offering today. It's not even serving in the capacity, which is all great. It is us. God so goes so far as to say that he defines the church as we are the family of God. It's the people. God sent Jesus not for buildings, not for worship songs, not for messages, but for people, his people that he created, his family. And when we come to that understanding, what we come to, the, what we come to realize is this, is that our faith that we have in Jesus is not an individual thing, but it's a collective thing, that we are meant to do this together. Do you know we are gathering here today because of one reason and one reason only, and it's not a reason, it's a person, it's Jesus. There's one thing that is uniting all of us together today, and that is the person of Jesus and the sacrifice and sufficiency of Jesus Christ. That we come here, we come here together, united around him and him alone. Not around a message, not around a song, not around a building, but him. Because this whole thing does not exist for us. Right? The church does not exist to meet my needs. The church exists to meet the needs of the people who don't know Jesus. That's why we exist. This is not a country club. Where because you put some money in, you feel like you paid your dues and you can get whatever you want. No, no, no. We are the family of God. We are the representatives of God on the earth, as Paul would say, his ambassadors. And we are doing this together. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is the great equalizer because there is no racial barrier. There is no ethnic barrier. There is no language barrier. There is no socioeconomic barrier. There are millions of people around the world today gathering because of one reason and one reason only, and that's Jesus, and that's the church. And we need each other. There is no such thing in, in, in Christianity as a Lone Ranger Christian. We're the family. So is it important that you come? It is. Let me show you the importance that the new book the first Christians placed on this. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 45, uh, 47. These are right after Jesus resurrected. Peter preaches a great sermon. 3,000 people come to know who Jesus is. The church is just newly established. And uh, the, they're just new believers and trying to figure this out. Here's what they did in the beginning. And you'll see in this passage, I want you to look for the importance they place on meeting together. Here's what it says. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. 
a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracle, miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need, and they worshiped together at the temple. Everybody say, each day. Each day. Each day. And, I believe there's more. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. At each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. You see that? These people met together every day. They went to church every day. Do you want to come here every day? Every day. Not only did they meet in a temple every day, what were they doing? Hearing the message of Jesus, meeting together. After that, they went to each other's homes and ate together. And they were so crazy, they sold their stuff, pooled their money, and helped people that are in need. That'd be like, hey guys, what I want you to do today, go home, put your house on the market, sell your cars. Next week, come back here. We're going to put all of our money in the pot, and we're just going to try to help people. But we just need one of you to not sell your house and property, so we've got a place to sleep. <laughs> you see the mindset of these, of these first century believers? They had bills to pay. They had responsibilities. They had lives to live, yet they met every single day. To me, what that says is they understood something about being part of the family of God. They understood something about community and fellowship that, hey, we are in this together. We're not in this alone. Our culture has become increasingly individualistic, right? Even, even kind of the American dream and the roots is that one pulls themselves up by their bootstraps and makes it on their own. That's a lie. Amen. Nobody makes it on their own. It requires other people. To make it. We are all helping each other out, whether directly or indirectly. There is no such thing as an individual or overnight success. It all requires other people. And as the church, we are the family of God. So why is it important to come to church? Well, because the Bible shows us that it's always been and that we need it, but we need this communi community. We need this fellowship. I'm a firm believer that one day a week is not enough and simply hearing me talk and someone sing is not enough for your faith. Amen. Because this should never be the bedrock of our faith. This should be the icing on the cake. This should just be the culmination of our week. We're out there, we're reading our Bible, you pray, we're connecting with people. We come here together to celebrate, to lift up the name of Jesus. You know what I mean? To get maybe a little shot in the arm, to go back out and do it. But if this is the only time you connect with and put time into your faith, then you're missing it. Right, Because the church isn't this building. It's, it's each and every one of us. That's why we say small groups are so important. Taking a step from being a spectator and a consumer into being a participant. Go to next steps. Start serving in an area. Join a small group. Lead a small group. Do something. Get off your seat and move and get involved in the community. Because that is what it's about. And you say, well, Josh, isn't it self-serving for you as a pastor to say you want us to be here? I mean, uh, yeah, it's way better when the crowd's full. But I, I'm not doing this for me. I'm not up here because this makes me feel good. I firmly believe that if you will do these things, you'll, you'll be involved and come, that you will grow and that you will experience God and that your life will be better. I push you and encourage you to get involved and be in a small group, join a small group, lead a small group, serve somewhere because it's going to help you. It's going to help you. That's what it's about. So why should you come to church? Because the community, because we celebrate together, and because we grow. We grow in our understanding of who Jesus is, and we grow as people. We just realize that we're not where we used to be. You know, we, we exist to help you move from where you're at to where God wants you to be, and you'll recognize over time that you're not who you used to be. You speak different, you think different, you treat your wife or your husband and your kids different, you're loving people that used to drive you nuts, right? You, 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 what people do in the world isn't, isn't bothering anymore, your wants are changing, your, your desires are changing, and you're just like, man, I, I'm just becoming a new person. It's like, yes, you are. And we need to come to be reminded of Jesus and to celebrate Jesus and to lift up the sacrifice of Jesus because if he was not who he says he, was, he is, and if he did not resurrect, we might as well go home right now because there's no hope. The writer of Hebrews told a group of believers this, chapter 10, verse 25. 
And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. There had been a habit in this particular time where people had stopped going to church, had stopped coming together. Hey, let us not neglect our meeting together. Some people are foolish and they say this, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. I'm just going to stay at home and read my Bible. I listen to my own worship music, Joy F. M. It Up, yes. And I listen to to Preacher on TV. I I don't need to come to church to be a Christian. You're right, you don't. Coming here doesn't save you, but that's foolish thinking. And that is so contrary to the scripture. I challenge you, if that's the way that you think, or somebody you know thinks that way, to read the scripture and see if they can come away from it thinking that God wants him to do it alone. Yeah, Jesus can meet you wherever you're at. He's, he's met me in the bathroom, okay? He, 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 doesn't ex- he doesn't live here. But there's something about being the family of God and coming together and helping, helping each other grow and encouraging one another. In this case, they were, there were some dire times, and even and we'd have to be honest that we're experiencing a, a, an interesting climate, to put it lightly, in our own country, okay? We need each other, and America needs the church more than ever. Not buildings, but people. So come, fellowship, celebration, growth, excitement. And may it not just punctuate or begin your week, but may it just be a thing that where you just say, I've, I've got to get my family in church. We become a, not only an individualistic culture, but a busy culture too, right? We're busy, busy, busy. And I'm just concerned that sometimes we put sports and our children's activities, if you have families, above the importance of church. Let me, just, let me just say this, and this may step on some toes, and this isn't directed at anybody, but I think sometimes we invest in our kids in extracurricular activities more than we do in church, and I think that's wrong, because the chances of your child becoming a professional athlete are very slim, right? And, and, and I think that I understand it. I played, in, uh, I played on some select teams and, and had to travel and do those things. And my, you know what my parents did? I just, I just give this up to my parents. I, I, I would come to church. We'd come to first service. I'd put my football equipment on in the bathroom of the church, and then we would leave and drive out to wherever the game was. Like, they taught me that, hey, it's okay to be involved in extracurricular things. You can do that, but you're going to go to church. Yeah, you can go to practice and get out of wrestling practice on, at, at 6.30 at night, but you're going to come to church that night. And my parents just instilled in me that it wasn't just a habit of going to church, but you know what? I didn't become a professional football player or wrestler. In fact, I was a horrible wrestler. <laughs> I got beat all the time. But what happened is, is that I saw the value of what it means to be involved in church and to make Jesus a priority in my life. Don't let the busyness of your life, maybe it's not your kids and maybe it's not extracurricular activities, but don't let that take precedence for your children because you're teaching them that things are more important than God. God believed in the church enough to send Jesus. And I think if we, we need to place the same value that he does on it. That's all I gotta say. Amen? Amen. All righty. No more toes could be stepped on for the rest of the day, I promise. Uh, here's the third question, third and final question. Why should I believe in Jesus over other world religions? I I liked the second part of this question that um, wasn't up here, but it said, and how do I explain the differences? Why should I believe in Jesus? What separates Christianity from other world religions? And how do I talk to people about that? I think for us, um, one of the things that we're we're caught in that's difficult if you've grown up as 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 a believer in America is that it's becoming less convenient to be a Christian and it's becoming more incumbent upon us to be able to talk about our faith and why we believe what we believe. We used to just be able to say, well, I believe in Jesus, and you should believe in Jesus. Why? Because the Bible says, okay, people don't believe in the authority of Scripture anymore. People don't just accept it because it's the American thing to do. In fact, if anything, Christianity is is being pushed out. Right? And now more than ever, we have to be able to explain why we believe what we believe. That doesn't make our faith any less. It just makes us have to study more and have to be able to understand what's going on. You know, there's a a, a prevailing thought out today that all religions are are fundamentally the same, right? And and all paths lead to God. So whatever your path, if your path is Buddhist or Hindu or or Islam or or naturalism, it's not going to lead to God anyway because you should just be a good person. So they're fundamentally the same and just superficially different. That's the prevailing thought. It's all subjective, right? And whoever God is for you, I mean, you know, as long as you get to God, then, then you're good to go. That's what 
we're being taught. That's what's being, the narrative that's being pushed in culture today. When the reality is that all world religions are not fundamentally the same. They are all fundamentally different with superficial similarities. Amen. They're fundamentally different with superficial similarities. And before we dig into this question, I think it's important to understand what a worldview is. Because we all hold a worldview. Every person on the earth holds a worldview. What is a worldview? Here's a very simple definition. A worldview is an overall perspective from which one sees and interprets the world. A collection of beliefs about life and the universe held by an individual or a group. We all have a worldview. Growing up in America, a lot of people, their worldview is Christianity. That's what frames the worldview. You grow up in the East, Buddhism, Hinduism. Grew up in the Middle East, Islam. It's your worldview, how you see it. And a worldview, is, is, everyone has one. Everyone. You can't sit here and say you don't have a worldview. That's how you make sense of the world. We've grown up in an area where the predominant worldview for many, many years was, was Christianity, and that's changing rapidly, rapidly. But a worldview answers four very basic yet profound questions that every human being has. Four basic yet very profound questions. The first one is the question of origin. Where did I come from? Where did I come from? Second one is meaning. Why am I here? Why am I here? Third one, morality. How do I separate or how do I differentiate good between bad? And the fourth one is destiny. What will, I, what will happen to me when I die? Where will my eternal resting place be? Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Answer those four questions. We all have those questions, whether you think about them consciously or you think about them unconsciously. Where did I come from? How did I get here? Okay, why am I here? Well, well then how do I know how to make decisions, what's good, what's bad, and then what's going to happen when I die? If you're young, you don't think you're going to die. But the older you get, you ask that question more and more. I've had the unfortunate opportunity to sit with people on their deathbed, even people that believe in Jesus, still wondering what's going to happen when I die. And a worldview answers those questions or attempts to answer those questions. And the question becomes, how does Christianity differ and what separates it from the other worldviews when it comes to this issue? Take a look at Buddhism. Here, 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 here's, here's the differences. Buddhism has four noble truths, the eightfold path, and the ultimate goal in Buddhism is to purify the mind and extinguish human desire because human desire is seen as evil. To get to the point where you don't have any desire, purify the mind. That's the ultimate goal. Hinduism, 330 million deities. Everything is God and God is in everything. Cycle of, of birth and death and rebirth. Reincarnation, where you're constantly, you're paying for in your present life something you did in your previous life. Ultimate goal is union with the divine. But how do you get there? I don't really know. You just got to work at it. You got to find it, discover it. And it's fully contingent upon your, your abilities and, and, and the way that you live your life. And, and your eternal resting place and destiny is never fully it, it, it rock solid because you don't know. You don't know. But 330 million deities. Islam, five pillars, right, of Islam. The ultimate goal of Islam is to spend an eternity with Allah. How do you get to spend an eternity with Allah? You, you follow what they say you should do, prayer and fasting and all those things, but yet at the end of the day, it's fully up to the will of Allah whether you spend eternity with him or not. You have no sense of assuredness in that. How do I get forgiveness? How do I, how do I get to the divine? Most world religions are just that thing. It's about man getting to God and whatever God is, whoever God is. Whatever man has to do, in almost every case, man fails, and it's just a, a miserable cycle of trying to be good enough. So what separates Christianity from the other worldviews? Story has it that C.S. Lewis, the great apologist and philosopher and, and um, professor who was once an atheist but became a Christian, was at an international conference of religious leaders and they're debating this question, this very question, what separates Christianity? And he comes in late and story goes is that he says, what's all the fuss about? And they say, well, here's what the fuss is about. What separates Christianity? This is what we're debating. And C.S. Lewis, without missing a beat, says, it's easy. The one thing that separates Christianity from every world religion is grace. Grace. The unearned, unmerited favor of God. The one thing, or let's say it like this, the one person that separates Christianity from every other world religion is Jesus. Jesus came on the scene and claims to be God. God incarnate. And claims that he's going to die and then be resurrected again. That's a crazy claim. 
So Jesus Christ, here's the crux of it, because someone said, I don't believe the Bible, therefore I don't believe in Jesus. Well, what about the historical figure of Jesus? Because he really lived. Let's look at the historicity of Jesus. And Jesus' claim to be resurrected is an amazing claim because he said that he would be physically resurrected, not just spiritually resurrected, right? But physically resurrected. He's either who he says he is or he's a lunatic and a liar. Jesus' resurrection was recorded and verified by over 500 witnesses. Jesus historically rose from the grave. And Christianity is the only world religion that provides forgiveness and freedom and salvation freely to humanity on the basis of you receiving it, not on the basis of you earning it. Every other world religion, you have to earn something. You have to work for it. And your, your, your sense of eternal destiny, that last question, where do I go when I die, is always in limbo. But with Christianity, we can be sure today that if we've accepted Jesus Christ, all of our sins have been forgiven and paid for. And we can spend eternity with the creator of the universe. And he did that not because we earned it, but because he loved us and he created us, that he provided a way to establish that. Jesus is the only one. And Christianity is the only worldview that can sufficiently and fundamentally answer the questions of the human heart. And when submitted to these four questions, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny, it is the only one that answers them with, with correspondence and coherence, with truth. The only one. Someone says, I, I don't believe in the Bible. Okay, okay. It comes down to this. It's the question that Jesus asked his disciples. He said, who do you say that I am? Well, some say that you're a prophet, Jesus. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're this. And Jesus says, no. Who do you say that I am? Every person in the world has, will have to answer that question at one day. Every person in this room, you have to answer that question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Well, I believe in God. That's great. But who do you say Jesus is? Because God can be many things to many people. But Jesus he either is who he says he is, or he's a crazy lunatic and a liar. Who do you say that he is? And that's the question, because our entire faith hinges upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If there is no resurrection, the Bible is simply just a good book. But if there was a resurrection, then that fundamentally changes everything for every person that they can freely receive Jesus, freely have forgiveness and freely live a life of meaning and purpose and not earn it, but just receive it. So who do you say that he is? Could you stand with me this morning? Pray. And we're going to have a great, great day. And after we pray here in this moment, our prayer teams, prayer teams will be down here, down in the front for any need that you have. But I would just love to take this opportunity to pray over you this morning and also ask that you just think about some questions you want to ask next week unless you want to have a steering contest. Um, just ask those questions. It's going to be a good day. And those questions concerning race and that too. But would you bow your heads with this? I want to just kind of end on this question here today. Is there anybody in here I ask that question, who do you say Jesus is? And you say, you know what? I've never said that he is the son of God. And I recognize that I've got sin in my life and I need a savior. I need Jesus Christ. I want to invite him into my life. If that's you here today, would you raise your hand? I'd just love to pray with you. If that's you today. I just want to give the opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the person of Jesus. Father, we thank you that you've given him freely, that it's not something that we earn, that, that it's not something that you look at our behavior and decide whether or not Jesus applies to us, but you spoke so clearly 2,000 years ago when you climbed on that cross and you gave yourself, and then three days later you did raise from the dead, that we know and can be sure that we have eternal life and relationship with the creator, God. I pray that you help us, Holy Spirit, to answer that question inside of our hearts so clearly 
and confidently. And I pray, Lord, just as we also discussed about why it's important to come to church, that as we answer that question, that we consider that every time we walk through these doors and the worship begins, that, Father, we collectively celebrate you, Jesus. That even if everything else in our life is seemingly going in the, in the opposite direction that we want it to, that, Lord, we can, we can worship you, Jesus, because you're the very best of heaven. And that you not only make our lives better, but you save us. And we thank you for that. Well, we just pray that for the rest of this week as we leave this place that our eyes be fixed on you. We thank you for providing every single one of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Show us your mercy. Give us your favor and your grace and bring us back safe next week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen.